from MHN and CBE. And uh, here we're here today with uh, Toby Bizzuto and Tom Bizzuto, the leaders of uh, Bizzuto Construction and Management uh, companies, uh, well known throughout the Eastern Seaboard and the multifamily and retail industries. And uh, talking about their perspective on markets, national policies, and uh, anything else that's on their mind. So uh, first, uh, Toby, uh, pleasure, pleasure to meet you. Tom, pleasure, pleasure to meet you today. Uh, Ken, I wonder if you could uh, give us uh, your perspective on the apartment and retail uh, sectors and where those markets are going uh, in the eastern seaboard markets that you operate in. Sure. We're, we're extremely bullish on the apartment sector. I mean, there's been moments of oversupply that come and go, uh, but we believe in the long-term demographic demand for apartments. And we believe we're in the right markets. We operate from Northern Virginia to Boston, all the way over to Chicago. And we've been extremely um, happy with the past few years. And we believe we're, we're about to get to a point of rent growth kicking in, which has been quite some time. Uh, Tom, you've been through a couple of cycles before. No. How would you contrast uh, been, the long bull we've had no. here? With, uh, and I guess in Washington, not so much a bull. No, uh, it's, I mean, this has been a, um, you, you know, as I reflect on 45 years of this business, I can't think of another time that we have had as good a cycle as we've had this one, as that's lasted as long. And, and, you know, like Toby, I believe this is going to continue. I mean, there, there'll be peaks and valleys and that will vary from market to market. But, but if you look at the demographics, if you look at both the millennials and the baby boomers who are simplifying their lives, um, you can't help but believe the apartment market is just going to be terrific for another decade. And it's actually something that we share as well. I mean, we've looked at this uh, quite a bit and, uh, you know, almost trying to be a naysayer and like, no, I mean, the demographics are really good. Uh, the right. household formation numbers are there uh, in terms of home ownership rates and ownership rates. Uh, so it's almost like uh, we're sort of scared of, of good news. No, no. <laughs> you know, in our industry, right. you're so used to being uh, cyclical. Uh, could you kind of focus with me, if you could, on a, a couple of markets that have been particularly strong for you and a couple of markets perhaps that, um, you know, have been weak, but you think are, are on the cusp of turning around? It's a good question. I, I think uh, for us, we've seen Washington, D.C., obviously, has been very robust. There's been a tremendous demand, e even in light of unprecedented supply. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is a wonderful thing. And, and we've seen uh, Boston very much in the same vein. It's been a very, very difficult market to build in, and that's a good thing. The barriers of entry being right. high. So, we, again, I think the markets that we operate in are what we call gateway markets. Mm -hmm. And the, the very nature of the, them being more difficult to develop in, developing is actually better for us. So, Jeff, I think it goes back to what you were saying earlier. I think we're all a little amazed, um, if we're honest with ourselves, at how steady demand has remained, notwithstanding the amount of supply that's been sure. added to the market. I mean, surely we've not been able to push rents as much as we right. might have liked to in Washington, yeah. and, and some markets, yeah, yeah, correct. not just Washington, but some 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 markets for um, recently. But but. Um, you look at occupancies and look at lease up pace, and you kind of have to pinch yourself a little bit. Yeah. So, how does this impact your strategy? And you guys are well known um, in the development realm, and I wonder whether you know what you guys are working on in terms of enhancing your strategy or, or uh, taking it to the next level in terms of investment development or, or operations. So, the, the more and more people that get into our business, the more commoditized it seemingly becomes. So. We have tried to differentiate ourselves by saying, instead of just creating a product for our customer, let's create an experience. So our mantra internally here is we're in the business of creating extraordinary experiences. So what does that mean? It means building buildings with more design features, more authenticity, better locations, something that resonates with our customer. And that is a way that we can differentiate ourselves competitively from some very, very good developers in town. So you mentioned experiences, and I think we're even seeing this in some of the retail sales data uh, in terms of uh, orientation away from expenditure on goods toward expenditures on services, experiences. How does that relate to some of your mixed-use uh, work that you've been doing? 
as, as you can imagine, the projects that we have that are the most successful are those that present mixed use experiences. We, we broke ground literally a week ago on a project in Baltimore that's anchored by a 50,000 square foot Whole Foods on the ground floor. Mm -hmm. And it's Whole Foods intent. Even with Whole Foods, who naturally you would go to visit Whole Foods, even they're coming up with a model now where they'll deliver the food to the units above. Okay. So even Whole Foods is trying to figure out what kind of experience can we give our customers. So I think you know, it's the old live, work, play model that right. we've all read about so much. And you're in pretty dense markets to begin with. Very much so. And is that part of your strategy is to stay in dense markets and, and focus on dense, uh, highly dense areas? Yeah, if, if, if it's not dense areas in cities, it would be dense suburban areas, meaning yeah. the suburban urban projects. Sure. Those are typically also anchored by grocery yeah. stores or other retailers. Can you talk a little bit about you know a lot of things that we've been hearing about uh, in ULI sur uh, surveys and other uh, developments, and I wonder if you could highlight a couple of your developments, maybe in the suburbs, that uh, have this focus on creating urban-like experiences in the suburbs or near suburbs. Sure. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I could, I'll take one. Sure, go ahead. There's a project we did called The Beacon at Watch Apple, and Watch Apple is in Crofton, Maryland, which is a suburb of Annapolis, and it's anchored by a Wegmans and a Target uh, and countless in-line, what they call in-line retail, of course. Sure. So the experience of our customer is that they go home and not only do they have an apartment, but they have the ability to effectively walk in a modern equivalent of a town center. And, and is that, uh, how does this also kind of lay into some of the common area experiences, or used to be called amenities, but common area experiences that you're trying to kind of facilitate? Well, I'm glad you made that uh, slip because <laughs> to us, a common area is not just expensive finishes or expensive design. There's got to be some quality to it that makes people want to congregate in it or use it. And, you know, my father's always taught me we're, we're creating what he calls sanctuary for our, our residents. So if we're able to create a space in which people feel like they're coming home, that is incrementally better than just a commodity product with the latest, greatest gadgets in the, in the washing machine. And then, Jeff, I've, um, as I've thought about this phenomenon, I've thought about it as sort of the Europeanization of America. Mm -hmm. um, and that if you, if you go to European towns, um, the homes people live in are generally, the space they have is generally fairly small. small. Um, and they live out in the public areas. Mm -hmm. And what we provide in our communities is sort of a series of, of, of um, stages mm -hmm. of public activity. Mm -hmm. So you have your private space within your home. Um, and for a, particularly people downsizing, it's smaller than what they're used to. Sure. Um, but they, they have then access to all these wonderful public spaces within the community, mm -hmm. some of which are more private than others, um, some where they can be you know, exposed to all their neighbors and others where they have some level of privacy if they want to sit and just work on their computer. And then they can go out into these public areas where they have access to the amenities that right. are as the, the, the retail amenity that are as important as the, the, the environment is. Talk, maybe expanding upon it a little bit, we talked about, uh, let's maybe talk a little about sustainability and uh, energy conservation, energy use. And you guys have done some pretty advanced work. I mean, I think particularly about uh, uh, geothermal at the sure. SAGE at uh, Maple Lawn. Could you maybe explain to me what, it, what, that, what that is? Sure. Uh, for those well, who ge ge heard ge about it? geothermal, um, I, I, I've actually had geothermal energy in my home for 30 years. Um, and, and it's a, a system that, um, and I'm not an engineer, um, so I won't explain it accurately, but basically it, it, um, it, the pipes that run through the condenser are underground and they're filled with a fluid that runs underground so they have the constant air temperature, the 55 degree air temperature, the 55 in the winter and 55 in the summer. 
And it's a lot easier to both get heat out of that and, and chill it. And the result of this, the energy cost is less um, than it would be with a normal heat pump, or in some respects, even with more conventional systems. Um, the, they, the, I will have to admit, the system I had that was 30 years old it was a very different system than the one we, we're using today. Right. But, but we have had a commitment to conservation uh, for a very long time. When, when the um, Energy Star program was first created by the Department of Energy, it was created for single family homes. Right. Uh, at the time, we had a fellow working with us who was married to a woman who worked in energy. And um, we worked with them to try and modify those standards and adapt them to townhouses and multifamily. Um, we have tried to use Energy Star on it with any property where we could possibly use it. We've been using it on our home sales for, forever. Right. Um, the, the, um, we did another project um, where we were very focused, not, not so much on energy conservation, but on, um, we, we build fairly close to the Chesapeake Bay, and so we're worried about the, the um, seepage of particularly nitrogen uh, into the bay. And so we came up with, again, a program I can't fully explain, but it was a way of, of preventing the runoff of nitrogen that typically accompanies, accompanies development. Um, and, you know, it was a very successful project. So it's, it's something that's important to us. In terms of, of making those uh, investments in energy conservation, kind of pencil out financially or economically, uh, are most, you find a lot of these are able to, to capture the returns or do they reduce the sort of the total co cost of renting uh, to, to the renter? I, I, I think you would have a very hard time proving that there is an economic benefit to the developer of doing it. I, you know, it's always frustrated to think yeah. um, that, that even back when we were first doing Energy Star and nobody else was, and you'd go, and go in, and this was on the home sales side, and you'd go into the sales office and ask the, sub, the, the salespeople whether anyone asked about it, whether, and it was always mm -hmm. sort of a nice to have. Yes. So I think it's one of those things we do because it's right. Um, and we believe in it um, more than because we get a lot of kudos for it or because we get a lot of economic benefit. I do believe that with the millennials, um, that there tends to be an expectation that you're going to do the right thing. Right. Um, I don't think and a penalty do. for not doing the right thing. And the penalty is they'll go someplace else. Right. But I don't think they pay any extra for it. Okay. Cool. Uh, Let's uh, turn it right now to, to focus on uh, national policy. Um, you talked recently uh, with us about um, your concerns about America's lack of sufficient uh, right. decent affordable housing. And I, I wonder if you could you know, uh, expound a little bit on your views of how we as a nation can address that issue, how we as an industry address that issue. And what's not getting done, and what you know we think should be done. Sure. I, well, first of all, um, the, the, to, to say something I've said a hundred times, both privately and publicly, a, a piece of lumber doesn't care whether it's being used in a rich man's house or a poor man's house; it costs the same. And that's true with bricks, mortar, anything else. I mean, it, the cost of 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 building is roughly the same. So you can't, we as a private sector group, can't build housing for poor people. That problem has to be solved with government involvement. Um, the point I made in our discussion in that article was that um, you can try and do it through housing programs, but if the government really was committed to solving a housing problem, they would put money in the hands of the renters or buyers and let the industry, which is pretty good at filling, at, at, at meeting demand, 
uh, meet the increased demand. So in your view, it's more of an income uh, supplement I, I'm, issue I'm than a, it is I'm, any other absolutely. Any other I mean, you, uh, we we do we do our share of tax credit um, uh, housing. We're committed to doing it because it's the best hope we've got. Mm -hmm. But it, it's so complicated, and it's done by such a small sector of the industry. Yes. That it's always struck me that boy, if you could have the entire building industry, residential building industry, building housing that people could afford, um, wouldn't it be better than having ten percent of the industry doing it? And and so I believe that the, the real solution is to increase demand by providing money in the form of housing vouchers. I've heard many people on this topic. You know, but you could expand upon this talk about the fact that because housing is local and the approvals in, in, as you're building housing is local, that the uh, uh, fees and, and uh, regulatory burdens of local housing, and that's why it's not addressable necessarily at a national level, uh, has become so burdensome, so onerous that, that you know, the solution is more of a local solution than it is a federal solution. And, and, uh, you know, for Seattle, they've been very welcoming to development, still at the high end, but at least more supply. And I wonder if, if you know, based upon your development track record in the Eastern Seaboard, that kind of informs you about the really, you know, difficulties uh, of building of, uh, affordable housing in the Eastern Seaboard. Yeah, I mean, it, it's an issue. We're all striving towards the same goal, which is to provide housing at many different income levels. And that's our ultimate objective. Uh, local jurisdictions each have their own bent on how to accomplish that, and I believe very strongly that m most of these people are led with the very best of intentions. Uh, but unfortunately, in each jurisdiction, you're effectively reinventing the wheel. And there's a lot of best practices that aren't shared, and there's a lot of common knowledge that should be shared from, from this exercise. So we can go, simply, in, I'll use Maryland, one of the places we do business, each county may have a different, does have a different model of affordable housing. Mm -hmm. So we have to change our, our plan and our model in each jurisdiction that we're in. And you spend a lot of time in regulatory uh, conversations and, and not getting housing built. Mm -hmm. So it's slowing down the ultimate production of housing. So I, I think that an in industry as a whole, uh, in, ULI's in Twilica Workforce Center has really pushed this, needs to communicate better with local planning jurisdictions. And we need to learn from each other and share best practices. Uh, I'm going to shift a little bit um, uh, to talk about capital markets. Um, you guys are obviously out all the time raising capital uh, for your projects. How do you look at the current state of your investor base uh, in terms of their willingness to invest in, in, in commercial real estate right now? Uh, and uh, kind of any kind of uh, reading of the tea leaves that you see based upon their comments to you. I'll start with that. Sure. I think, um, you know, I'll speak for the mid-Atlantic or at least what we're seeing in the multifamily space, which is we've all had an embarrassment of riches in the past few years with a tremendous amount of supply being built, i.e. a tremendous amount of equity and debt coming into the market. Right. And many of our friends in that space are telling us that they have somewhat of a reticence to overdo it again. Um, you know, we didn't overdo it this time, but we're getting close. So the, the best governance there, or a governor of growth would be banks and equity retracting a little bit. Uh, I had an opportunity to, to be with a very large bank last night. And what their thesis is, is we will do loans, we will work with you, but we're going to work with selective, uh, what they call sponsors, right? right? Selective developers. We think that those companies that have a long history and a long track record with those banks will fare better in these tougher times than those companies, however good, that might be newer. Are you finding, or do they communicate, that there's been a new round of regulation of the banking industry related to uh, hot, uh, hot HVCRE? Yeah. And I wonder, you know, is that having an impact uh, on that? There's no doubt, Jeff, that both the capital requirement uh, expansion and the change in the regulatory environment is constraining debt. But I think, you know, bankers are like the rest of us. They, 
they, they find a way to do business when they want to, and they right. have excuses when they don't want to. Mm -hmm. And as a banker friend of, and of mine said, we uh, remember very well that we lost money when we invested in the eighth and ninth inning of the home building cycle going into 2007 and eight. And we think that's where we are today in the apartment industry. My response to that is, well, you're absolutely right, except this is the double header and this is still the first game. Right, um, right. Because of the demographic issues with that we mentioned. Exactly right. 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 Exactly right. right. And actually, from our perspective, and this is sort of selfish, I guess, but we're not unhappy to see the banks tighten up a little, a little bit. Um, well, it's really, they're it's, it's lengthening the cycle, right? They're, you're not having the kind of supply response one would expect. Absolutely. Given sure. the projected, de projected demand. Absolutely. Which kind of cycles back on, it gets transmuted into an affordability issue. Sure. And so, I guess the, the question one might ask in this environment, which looks fantastic, is, you know, is there the potential of a regulatory backlash in some of the urban areas in terms of, let's say, you know, what it seems like a simple solution called rent control? Sounds easy. Uh, it blows up, up in a million different ways. It, it, are there any other regulatory concerns or, or, or policy concerns on your mind um, that, that might cause you to, some thought? Again, I, I, I bring it back to on a local level, even done with the best of intents, to react to whatever problems these regulations have created. The issue is that each jurisdiction will do their very best to interpret the problem and solve the problem. And the net result is some may do it right, where others may be too far reaching. Yeah. It could exacerbate the issue. But one of the things that's happened at the local level that has not gotten a lot of press um, is that they are re the, and they being the local tax assessors yes. are reading all the press put up by our good friends, the brokers, about how about these lovely prices we're getting when we sell our assets, right. and taxes have been going up on existing properties dramatically. Um, and my, you know, that's in our market area, we're saying that. Yes. Uh, but my impression is that's happening across the country. Um, and, and the consequence of that is to make it, um, make it necessary to push rents even higher. Right. So it's, it's, it's this phenomenon that we said we all want the same thing. Um, the, 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 but the problem is and particularly at the local level, sometimes they impose, they they have so many other things they want mm -hmm. that conflict yes. with affordable housing. Now, as you talk about, you know, Bazudo in particular, you know, where um, do you, are you guys taking the company now? I mean, you're a very successful organization, you know, 50,000 units under management, a billion dollars built, really kind of grown this thing. Where do you see is the next stage of development for your organization? Well, right here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, if we want to grow our business in a very sustained way, but in an intelligent way, that doesn't compromise any of the values that uh, were created by my father and his partners when they started the company 28, 29 years ago. So we will grow methodically. Um, we're expanding into, as I mentioned, the Boston market on the development side. Our, our management business has expanded into the Northeast, uh, into Chicago, and now into the South as well, or in Charlotte and Atlanta and Nashville. So as long as there are people craving these extraordinary experiences, and we believe that we can provide those to our customers, I think that's acceptable growth. Uh, but again, we're a private company, and anytime that we deviate from the, the values that where the career, how we got here in the first place uh, is, is not a step that I'm willing to take. Toby, Tom, thank you so much for your thank time. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Jeff, thank you very much.